Welcome to my Omega Protocol Ultimate series, a series in which I will break down each phase of this new ultimate one at a time, explaining our thought process and how we solve the mechanics with video evidence of said solutions. This video series might sometimes include infographics or rate plans explaining some particular solutions, but rest assured that it will always include POVs of each individual mechanic. Now enough for the intro, and let's say hello to Omega. This phase is short, about 2 minutes and 7 seconds in length, but this short duration is packed with intense mechanics that happen quite fast, require a lot of movement and a lot of quick thinking. Omega starts right away by casting Program Loop. This mechanic has essentially two mechanics going on at the same time, two towers that need to be soaked by one player each, and two tethers that explode in a big circular AoE at the exact same time that the towers are soaked. Each time a player is hit by a mechanic, they suffer from twice common win, which means that for the next set of mechanics, they will not be able to help and other players will need to handle them. This concept creates a tempo, which we'll talk about now. The first thing your group needs to do is to assign each player to a cardinal and intercardinal location. That ensures that at the start of the mechanic, players are relatively spread around and will make the upcoming decision making easier. Now the program loop cast just ended, and debuffs appear. The only important debuff is your number. That number signifies which set of towers you will need to soak. The ones go first, then the twos, then the threes, then the fours. Pretty simple, right? As far as the tethers, they will need to be handled in a different order to make sure that the twice come rune debuff falls off in time for a player to handle their next mechanic, which leaves with only one solution. For the first set of towers, players assigned with one will soak the towers, and players assigned with three will grab the tethers. For the second set, players assigned with two will soak the towers, and players assigned with four will grab the tethers. For the third set, Players assigned with 3 will soak the towers, and players assigned with 1 will grab the tethers. And for the final set, players assigned with 4 will soak the towers, and players assigned with 2 will grab the tethers. It is also important to note that if it is not your turn to either soak a tower or grab a tether, the safe waiting area is right next to a tower that is currently being soaked, as the tethers AoE should not cover that area, and you should not get hit. The way we handle which player goes to which location is by knowing who our partner is. During the entire duration of the mechanic, it is your responsibility to track where your partner is in the arena at a given time. There is no clockwise or counterclockwise rule we all go by. We use logic and deduction to understand what movement makes sense for both players of the pair. In the clip currently displayed, I was a 2 and I was partnered with the Dancer. The second tower spawned next to me, so he rotated to grab the other. For the final set of tethers, he was west, and I was south, so it made sense that I grabbed the tether from the east, and he grabbed the tether from his north. The idea is that the duo works together to make the best decisions so that the mechanic resolves smoothly. If you are in Discord, you can also communicate which tether you will grab when it is your turn. I will now be displaying on the screen a perspective for each number assignment. When you watch each POV, put yourself in the shoes of the player. Who is his number partner? Where is that partner on the screen? What should he be doing next? Where should he go next to be safe? Or which tether should he grab? Which tower should he soak? If you are capable of answering those questions, you are ready to be successful in program loop, and you will move on to Pento Crater. Pento Crater is similar in its design to the one that appeared in O11S, but requires a lot more movement and requires you to be quick on your feet when it is your time to peel out of the group. Five things happen in this mechanic. The boss will do a rotating flamethrower that could go clockwise or counterclockwise and needs to be dodged. All players will drop an AoE every two seconds and need to be baited appropriately. Each player will receive a number, which indicates when they will be hit by a guided missile, which has to be taken solo. As for the prey markers, they are wave cannons that are three-man stacks that happen periodically. At the start of the mechanic, split into light parties, one that will start at the south safe spot or clockwise if south isn't safe. 
and one that will start at the north safe spot or clockwise if north isn't safe. Your job is to stare at the debuff list for the four people in your assigned light party. If there is a duplicate of a number in your light party, one of you will need to cross and go to the other group. That will ensure that there is one of each number in each group. For the initial bait, the way our group handles it might be different from some other groups, but it ensures melee uptime. What we do is we run to the deep edge of the first disappearing AoE once we know if it is clockwise or counterclockwise, and that is where our baits start. For the following baits, we just keep rotating on the edge of the circles that we previously dropped, and the mechanic will play itself as you naturally will always have three people stacking together to handle the periodic wave cannons. The only critical role in this mechanic is the person handling the guided missile, identified by the number assignment. The way to handle it is simple but fast-paced. Once your debuff has about 2 or 3 seconds left on it, it is your cue to rotate away from your group for one circle, drop your guided missile, then cut back through the middle to catch up to your group. Sprint is not needed, but very welcome if available. Here is the mechanic played for each number assignment. In some of those POVs, I had to flex to the other group, which could happen to you depending on how your light parties are assigned and which duplicates there are in your light party. Once all the wave cannons and guided missiles are handled, Omega will start his last mechanic before he enrages. Three non-tank players will be assigned markers above their head, which will fire another wave cannon in their direction. Shortly after, the other three non-tank players will be targeted and shoot a wave cannon as well. In the meantime, the tanks are taking heavy damage from their tank cleave that is baited on the two furthest players from the boss. To ensure the tanks are targeted for the cleaves, the six non-tank players will resolve their wave cannons while standing on the boss's targeting circle. One beam will be aimed south, while the other two will be aimed east-southeast and west-southwest. The tanks in the meantime will be standing outside of the boss's hitbox, one standing northeast and one standing northwest. Once this mechanic is handled, the boss will cast his enrage, Atomic Ray. I needs to die before then. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon for phase two.